Hello, everyone, and welcome to Securities Lending Saturdays. If you want to learn the fundamentals of securities lending, then this is a place for you. Today, we're going to be talking about collateral in the first of two sessions, this Saturday and next Saturday. So I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. I'll be talking collateral and I'll be talking securities lending today. If that's what you want to be doing on a Saturday, then you are in the right place. Uh, here it's uh, it's uh, in the mid twenties, I think, and sunny outside. Uh, so, uh, but I'd rather be here with you talking securities lending. So, uh, if you are here with me, then either uh, you love securities lending like I do, you have a thirst for knowledge, or you're very sad like me. I'm not certain which it is. Uh, just a, a quick note: um, uh, we only we only do these on Saturdays. Uh, for the first 10 minutes uh, on LinkedIn Live and Facebook Live because the videos are always hard to find. And this is about building the fundamentals of the business. So we want people to be able to find these videos after the session is over. So at 1.10, so in seven minutes from now, we'll be switching over live to, um, uh, to uh, sorry, we'll be switching over only to YouTube. So if you're on LinkedIn or if you are on uh, Facebook watching us, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you have another few minutes to uh, to switch over. Uh, if you give me a minute, I will actually put up our uh, link there on YouTube, which is somewhere that I can't find right at the moment. Uh, but look, if you just go to, uh, there we go, here we are. <clears throat> if you check that out, that's a YouTube link. As I said, from 110, we'll be going straight over to that. So in this, the idea of the, of the fundamental series is every week we take one topic and we go live with it. And we just, uh, I, I do a slide presentation. Don't worry about taking notes. In the show description after the show, after I've had a chance to edit it, there'll be a link there where you can download not only this slide uh, deck from this uh, session today, but previous weeks as well, and sign up for the list so that we'll automatically send them to you and you don't have to uh, uh, worry about filling it in every week or trying to download them every week. So that's the plan. Um, I'll be making references uh, throughout the session to previous episodes I've done as well. So what I recommend you do is check out the playlist because the playlist, they're very clearly labeled. There'll be there's one on statistics, there's one on characteristics, there's one on market participants. So uh, it should all be pretty clear for you there. Um, and <clears throat> in any case, I'll be putting them in the show notes. So without any further ado, uh, for the next five minutes, we'll be live on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube, and then we'll be switching over. And hopefully you'll be able to stay with us let me just set up my my slides and share my screen, and we'll get over to it. Okay, so this is what we're talking about today, uh, collateral, as I've said, and let's just get to it. So this week, um, we are going to be talking about, as we said, the collateral um, <clears throat> part one. Uh, last week, we did drivers, so the trading drivers the execution process, and the trading strategies that many of the intermediaries use to implement their lending activity. Previous week, it was about players, stakeholders, and structures of the business. Before that, characteristics and statistics. And of course, we started at the start, <clears throat> which is, why does it even exist? So I recommend if any of those topics uh, grab your attention, uh, look for them in the playlist of the fundamentals on YouTube. Now, each of these can be expanded out into quite a lot of depth. All right. So we originally were going to do this in eight weeks. And then I realized pretty quickly on that uh, eight weeks wouldn't be enough to do it. And a lot of the feedback that I got from viewers was they wanted it more fundamental. That's exactly what we've actually done here. Um, so we haven't put an end date on it. We're just going to keep doing Saturdays at one o'clock until we think we've exhausted the topic. Uh, and then, you know, who knows where we'll go from there. But 
that's uh, Collateral One. Now, why why two parts for Collateral? Look, the reality is that um, Collateral is uh, the mo- the second most ris- important risk mitigant. Now, why do I think it's the second most important mitigant? And that's because the first one is choosing who you trade with, right? So if I'm a borrower, you're a lender or vice versa, the most important thing I can do is to pick good, strong, solid counterparties to deal with because if you're still in business, then I'm never going to have a problem. The worst that can happen is, you know, you might renege on a contract and then I can still take you to court. But if you're still in business, you know, I can make my case. But if you are out of business because I've chosen a weak counterparty to deal with, then that's a problem. So the most important thing you can do is pick a good counterparty. The second most important thing you can do is take collateral that you feel comfortable with. All right. So this is incredibly important. Now, while it's important, one of the other problems that we actually see is that it's also complicated and it's mostly hidden. And that's kind of why I think it's a little bit like um, <clears throat> like uh, uh, rocket ships, because uh, frankly, there's a huge amount of engineering that goes into it. Uh, we don't really see it. All we see is it blasting into space, and we just trust that all the engineering underlaying it uh, is working uh, soundly, but put together well and is efficient. So complicated and hidden. Fundamentally, though, the reason that this is critical for everyone to understand is that most of the losses that have arisen from securities lending businesses are as a result of problems on the collateral side, not in the securities lending side as such. So it's been an issue with either what can be done with the collateral or what was done with the collateral or what wasn't done with the collateral. So we'll talk about a lot of those risk side of things next week, whereas today we really just want to get a firm grounding on collateral itself. Now, a quick thing, um, uh, I'm going to be switching over now. Uh, So if you are watching on LinkedIn or if you're watching on Facebook and you want to keep watching this, that'd be great. Love to have you with us, but you need to switch over to YouTube That's the link there. Um, I hope to see you over there. But now I'll be saying goodbye to Facebook and and LinkedIn users and sticking with YouTube. Okay. So we're now just, uh, now we're back with with YouTube only. Um, And as I said, collateral is important and we're doing two sessions because it's the second most important risk mitigant. It's complicated and largely hidden from most people's view and understanding. And third, and most importantly, most securities lending losses have arisen because of decisions made on the collateral side rather than on the lending side. Today, we're going to talk about the purpose and benefits, the two different models that operate in the market and how the collateral choice actually affects the fees and how much money you can make. So it might be uh, it might be a bit of a surprise to people that the collateral you choose to take impacts your fees, but that in fact is the case. So for anyone that's actually with us, um, maybe you want to just drop a comment into uh, uh, into the chat um, or comment box. Tell us where you're actually watching from. We usually get quite a, a global and diverse group watching this. And if you are not watching it live and you're watching it on replay, that's great as well. We want to hear where you're from uh, because we always answer on comments. All right. So uh, that's what we're talking about, purpose and benefits of collateral, two models, and how collateral affects fees. First of all, it's important to ask ourselves, why do we even take collateral? You know, when I started in this business uh, and when I moved to the UK in the uh, mid-1980s, originally, the trades that we did weren't collateralized. And that really surprises people because they say, oh, my God, Roy, you're actually lending 
your securities to someone and you're not taking any collateral, what if they go bust? And that's a that's exactly the right question to ask. But you have to look at it. When you make a cash deposit with a bank, that's actually an unsecured loan. You're giving your cash to a bank and you hope that bank is still there when you want your cash back. And when that uh, bank has your money, they don't just sit with it. They do things with it. And that's how they earn interest to pay you interest on your cash. Okay. So there you are giving them your cash. They're putting that cash to work. They're generating some income from that. And they're actually sharing a portion of that with you. And the reason I picked this diagram is because people always look at securities lending as if it's something weird or unusual and it's you know it, it's crazy it is complicated but it's not really that strange because this whole idea of of lending something and taking collateral is not something specific to securities lending it's how most of the world works so if you look at the first example uh, it's actually a loan for your property it's your mortgage and you're giving your house as collateral against the cash loan. Well, in securities lending, you lend out your securities and you take collateral of some type as protection to make certain that you get your securities back in future. And the same with just a, an unsecured loan. So an unsecured loan, the bank is just lending you money. They're taking a risk on you. And they will make that decision based on your credit history, based on your assets, based on your income, based on a series of questions. And so going back to my story about the 1980s, we were lending securities to counterparties where we've assessed their credit risk, we've assessed their financial strength, and we've made a decision that they're good counterparties to deal with, and we believe that we will get our securities back. So securities lending uncollateralized is not any different really from making a cash deposit in a bank because they don't give you any collateral. They promise to give it back. Or when a bank makes an unsecured loan to you, they're trusting that you'll give it back. Now, in most cases, people take collateral for transactions because you know there's a lot of risk in this world. Some of it you can assess and some of it you can't. Some of it is a surprise. COVID was a surprise. Now, what does taking collateral do? Well, first of all, what taking collateral does means that you are probably going to feel more comfortable trading with a wider group of people because now it's not just the most credit worthy counterparties, it's actually pretty good counterparties and collateralized all the time. So if you think that there's a big difference between your top five and your next five, well, some of that risk is reduced because you're taking collateral. And on the second point there, if I'm willing to uh, deposit into my bank cash of a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds or a thousand of whatever currency, because I think the bank is solid enough to be around in the future to give me back my thousand pounds. But am I going to put a million pounds in that bank or am I going to put 10 million pounds in that bank? I'm going to be less likely to do that because the higher the amount of unsecured risk I take on that bank, the more likely it is to go wrong uh, if something bad happens, something unexpected. Now, if all of a sudden I'm taking collateral from that counterparty, well, now a thousand is still safe, obviously, even safer. But now I might be more willing to do a million or 10 million or 100 million or whatever the figure is because my risk is reduced because I've got collateral. So it increases your willingness to trade and the size of the transactions that you trade with. Now, if you are a regulated entity, what that means is that uh, in some cases, your regulators make it almost impossible to trade without collateral, okay? Because what the bank, what the regulator says is, sorry, um, if, if people are having uh, problems with the sound, I keep getting messages that uh, there's problems with the sound. So if you're having problems, uh, just let me know. 
So let me go back to the regulated uh, collateral point of view. So regulators um, will look at banks and securities firms and broker dealers that are involved in the business and say, if you're trading with a counterparty and you don't take collateral, you have to set aside so much capital that it really doesn't make it economic to trade. So in fact, that's why collateral is is really um, widespread. It's just like, used everywhere in in many, many types of transactions. So regulators require capital or require collateral as a way of offsetting um, capital requirements. Now, the other point there is uh, everything in life is about risk and reward. So that's no different in securities lending. If I'm taking collateral, then the amount I'm going to charge someone to borrow my securities will be less because my risk in dealing with them is is lower. And if I take lots of collateral with, from them of the best quality, my fee might even be lower because my risk in lending it to them has been reduced. Or at least they'll argue that. They'll say, well, Roy, you know, I can see how you might want a high fee if it's uncollateralized. I can see how it might be a lower fee if it is collateralized. But if I give you the best collateral and I give you a lot of it, then presumably you should give me the best fees. And that makes a lot of sense. So collateralized transactions reduces the credit spread and improves pricing. And of course, at the end of the day, the primary reason you take collateral is because in the event of a counterparty default, <clears throat> what you've actually got is something to offset that. So if I have lent you something, and you go out of business, I'm going to dispose of that collateral and use the cash proceeds of that to buy back and replace whatever it is you borrowed from me so that I end up in the same place that I was at the start of the transaction. So that's the collateralization benefits. Now, I talked about two different models. These two different models, these are my labels. These are unofficial labels. They have no real sort of legal meaning. But broadly speaking, I've, I've structured this in a way that it kind of represents where most of the activity is. So in the first one, in the green box, we have the U.S. model. And the U.S. model uh, grew up really with cash being used as collateral. So I would lend you securities and I would take cash from you as collateral. And I, I again, I might take a little bit more value of cash than the value of the securities I've lent to you, because uh, if you go out of business, I have to buy back those securities and there might be price fluctuations and I might have to pay commission to someone uh, to buy them for me. You know, so so there's there are costs involved and I take that little bit of a buffer to give myself protection. But if I lend you securities and I take cash, just like a bank, when you make a cash deposit, they don't just sit with that in the bank. They put it to work. The same thing with securities lenders. If they take cash from a borrower, they put it to work. And they put it to work in the money markets with short-term, high-quality investments, and they try to generate a return from that. Now, when you make more investments, that adds leverage. So imagine, let's say you're a pension fund and you accumulate your money to invest from pension fund contributions. So you've already received $100. You then lend out those security, or then you buy securities with that $100. Then you lend those securities out and get maybe $102 or $105 of cash. Then you take that cash and you put it into the money market and you buy other investments with it, you're actually taking that original $100 and you're leveraging that portfolio to an extent. Okay, And you're generating incremental investment returns from that original $100 pension fund contribution. Now, if you are very good as a money manager and market conditions are right, and maybe even if you're a little bit lucky, uh, you can increase your returns pretty substantially from making good investments. And again, I'll address that more next week. 
And one of the downsides of this model is from a regulatory point of view, a cash loan or a cash collateralized borrow uh, increases the balance sheet of the borrowing firm. And since most firms are securities firms or broker dealers or banks, one of their main uh, guiding rules in life is they don't really want to increase the balance sheet, okay? Because it affects all kinds of uh, things as well as shareholder view of the return based on the size of the balance sheet. So increasing a balance sheet is generally a negative. So that's the US model, cash collateral, cash goes into the money market, it leverages the portfolio a little bit, generates potentially incremental returns and increases the balance sheet. You then turn to the yellow box, which is the European model. What you have is uh, what we call non-cash collateral. So I will lend you securities and you will give me other securities as collateral. And now because this is a securities versus securities uh, transaction, and the obligation is to give those securities back and get back the securities that I loaned out, it has no balance sheet impact. So that's a positive compared to the US model. And one of the reasons why the non-cash side of things has been growing over time, not the only reason, but it's really the primary reason. Now, one of the things I said with cash collateral is you could take it, and if you were a good investor, you could generate incremental returns. That doesn't happen with securities collateral because what happens is you agree at the time of the loan that it's going to be a non-cash collateralized loan and you agree a fee. And that fee is the fee that you generate. There's no opportunity as you would have with cash to generate incremental returns. Okay, So you have to be aware of that. So it only captures the intrinsic value of the fees. And then finally, as I said uh, a, a moment ago, because this doesn't increase the size of the balance sheet of the borrower, it's, it's more attractive to them to borrow against securities as collateral. And so what you have is, uh, and this represents an increasing share of the overall marketplace. Okay, so US model and European model and the reasons why there's a difference. Okay, so if this uh, if this is helpful, uh, these videos, then uh, it'd be great if you would uh, kind of give us a a thumbs up, and uh, if you haven't subscribed, uh, please consider subscribing because uh, that means that it's good for us. It means more people can actually see these these slides, uh, these presentations, learn about the fundamentals of this business, and this business is growing growing both at the retail side of things as well as the institutional side and uh, country after country. Okay, so if you haven't, <clears throat> please give us a thumbs up and subscribe and um, uh, ring the bell to make certain that you get uh, future videos as they arise. Now, getting back to this, the collateral side of things, there's really a series of different questions you need to ask. So you look at this kind of mix, this grid of potential collateral that you can take. It's debt, equities, cash, or other. I mean, there are, there are things that hang around the periphery, but don't spend too much time thinking about that because uh, that's a, a really small part of the business. So what do you need to think about when you're looking at this? Um, uh, number one, uh, you would be looking at diversification. So if you're giving me collateral, I don't want to have just one security as collateral. Um, I, I want to have a mix because if you give me an asset of, of say Lehman Brothers, well, on day one, it might be okay, but on day two or day 50 or day whatever, it might not be okay. So I don't want to be wholly reliant. I want to have a diversified portfolio of collateral just in case there's some kind of adverse movement for any one of the stocks. You know, you could have a, a massive stock price drop in, in, in a stock because something happened with that company that day, and you wouldn't want to be overly exposed to that entity. Now, the second point is liquidity. Imagine I have lent you securities, you go at a business, 
then I said I was going to dispose of the collateral and buy back those securities. So I really want to have securities that I can sell, that I'm pretty confident there's a lot of interest in there so that if I want to sell it, there'll be a market for buying that. So liquidity is also important. Uh, concentration limits, uh, it's, you know, similar to diversification, but uh, concentration limits might also take into account that I don't want to uh, take collateral from other financial institutions. So if you are a bank and you give me collateral that uh, is maybe stocks or bonds issued by another bank and there's a crisis with banks, now there's a really strong correlation between you as my counterparty where I have exposure and the collateral you've given me. So not only might you be going down the pan, but the collateral you're giving me might have knock-on effect because you're going out of business. So I might want to have concentration limits that say I don't ever want to have more than 20% or 25% of my collateral of one type or one sector or even from one country or region. So you might want to make certain that you have those kind of concentration limits in place. And then practically what happens is there's a daily management process because if I lend you something today that's worth 100 and um, I take 105 of collateral from you, well, you know, frankly, uh, that's today. What about tomorrow? Maybe the stock that I've lent you, maybe the price has gone up and the collateral that you gave me yesterday doesn't give me enough of that buffer. So there's a daily management process where uh, both sides look at the value of the securities that have been loaned out, the value of collateral that's provided, figure out what the new figure should be because there have been changes in, in prices, because there's a, a change in uh, foreign exchange rates if they're from different markets. Um, and there's a daily uh, settlement of that. So if I owe if I owe you some of your collateral back, I have to give it to you. If you owe me new collateral, you have to give it to me. And every day we manage this process so that uh, neither of us is exposed more than so that one day's fluctuation. Okay, so that's your collateral grid. Again, we'll go into more next week or maybe in future events because that can also be quite complex. Okay. Now we'll go to the next slide. Okay, uh, just some stats. This slide, next slide, I'm going to give you a couple of stats. So these are, are real stats. You can see where I've, where I've sourced that information. And as it says at the top, a really quick note on both of these graphs, the left-hand scale is different and smaller than the right-hand scale. So for instance, um, it looks like uh, the purple line is much bigger in the left-hand uh, chart relative to the orange line than it really is. Okay, so the orange line shows those securities loans which have been made where the deal has been against securities collateral, and the purple line shows transactions where the loan has been made against cash collateral. Securities collateral represents, depending on how you measure it, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the total value. So as I said, securities collateral, non-cash collateral is another phrase for it, that's a growing proportion of the market, and now it's a dominant proportion of that. Okay, So that's on the left-hand side, it shows for equity loans. So equity loans are dominated by non-cash collateral, and the right-hand chart is European government bonds, uh, which are also very active in the uh, in the lending market. Again, if you go back to uh, last week's session in uh, trading strategies, you'll see there's something on called collateral transformation. Again, I'll include a link to that video um, uh, in the in the show notes or when I do the editing to this video. Um, you'll see that again the left hand scale uh, is smaller than the right hand scale. So the orange line, even though it's it's higher than the purple line, it's actually much higher than the purple line. Uh, and in fact, even at the beginning of the uh, orange line, it was higher than the beginning of the purple line. So, so non-cash collateral dominates the European government scene. 
And again, if you go to the uh, show on who the market participants are, you'll know that there are various tri-party entities that I mentioned. I think I mentioned six. Uh, two of the biggest are Bank of New York and uh, JP Morgan, but there, there are others. So I recommend you go back to the other video to find out who they are. Uh, but uh, I've got a quote here from an article that uh, Brian Ruane of uh, Bank of New York Mellon made. And this is really just to give you a sense of scale of the business. So just their program uh, control uh, receives uh, or holds or manages or administers, however you want to describe it, about $4 trillion of collateral. And that's 200 collateral providers, people that are giving collateral uh, and 550 collateral takers. So that's more than just securities lending transactions. That's repo transactions. That's other structured transactions that have collateral in it. But that gives you an idea of the scale of this business and the number of entities that are involved. So um, uh, I thought that was interesting. Now, the other one I mentioned was JP Morgan. Uh, again, they have uh, uh, their tri-party program, again, a, a major program. And what they've uh, kindly provided to me here is some statistics which show the breakdown of what they actually have. So we talked about fixed income and equity. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's look at the right-hand chart first. So the green part is where JP Morgan tri-party is taking fixed income instruments as collateral. And what they've done is they've broken down which markets those are from. So you can see Japan, uh, Japanese, probably Japanese government bonds the, are 17% of the pool. The U.S. Uh, fixed income assets, so that'll probably also include corporate bonds, that's 14%. And then Europe, 10%, U.K., 3%. And then the gray scale side of it. That's where they're taking equities as collateral. So again, you can see here, equities are a huge component, and maybe it's no surprise that the uh, markets where those equities are accepted from are mainstream, probably large cap equities, uh, almost exclusively, right? Because you need to do that liquidity check uh, so that you really only want to be holding the best, highest quality and, and biggest and most actively traded uh, equities as collateral. So uh, that gives you a breakdown. And then this this other one is, I think, also quite interesting. So of the fixed income instruments that they're holding, those show the credit ratings. And as you can see, the credit rating uh, are, are all pretty high quality uh, collateral. So the majority of collateral is equities in mainstream uh, markets. Uh, the fixed income, though, is huge. And where they're taking fixed income, they are amongst the highest rated instruments that are there. So again, uh, quite quite interesting data shared by JP Morgan. So thanks. So thanks to JP Morgan and Bank of New York for that input. Uh, just a, a quick thing. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, we have some free stuff. Uh, this is, uh, you can find that on our website on the courses. So you can see a free one hour primer on securities lending, which is a much higher level uh, view than we would do on any one of these shows. So it gives you a, a really 30,000 foot overview of the business from beginning to end. Uh, so that's useful to do. But if you're really interested in the business, of course, we have a, a paid for course as well, which is eight lessons plus an exam. So we really dig into this stuff in great detail. Uh, and if you're actually a regulated person, then the continuing professional development uh, credits might actually help you. And these, of course, are online on demand, so you do them uh, when it's convenient for you. So uh, that's just a quick one if you want to learn more. Uh, I'm going to get back to um, the flows now. First, we're looking at cash collateral. So here, that first step was the agent lender lending stock to the borrowing intermediary. Then the next step is that the borrowing intermediary provides cash to the lender. Now, practically, actually, you know, in fact, it often works the other way around where the agent lender says, gee, you know, I don't know if I trust you. So why don't you give me your cash first? And once I've got the cash, then I'll give you the securities. But, you know, ideally, they'd be simultaneous. The reason that they aren't in some markets is because stocks might be moving in one country and cash might be using it, moving in another country. Mostly when cash is used, it's in US dollars. And so if it's a European stock or an Asian stock, those stocks would always have to move before 
the U.S. market's even open, and therefore you the lender would have an exposure. So sometimes the bilateral arrangements are that the lender says, "Give me the cash, and then I'll deliver you the securities." But you know, again, think of it practically that they uh, are simultaneous, even though that's not true from a risk perspective. Now, as I said, the agent lender, when they get that cash, they put that into the money markets. And then at some point in future, those, uh, those investments generate incremental returns. Then what happens is the lender, uh, practically what they have to do, in fact, is give some of the cash back to the borrower. Okay? And that's called a rebate. So the borrower says, well, look, I know agent lender, if I give you the cash, you're going to put it in the money market and generate a return. I want a little bit of that for myself because the truth is I can borrow that stock from you or any of your competitors. So give me some of it back uh, or I'll shop my business elsewhere. So there's a little bit of that money goes back to the borrower. The amount that goes back will depend on how widely available the stock is because If uh, the stock is really widely available, remember, again, go back to the last episode on the trading side. If there's huge supply, so imagine stocks like Apple or Microsoft, where it's really in everyone's portfolio. Uh, So any lending program can lend those shares out. So huge supply. And the borrower says, yeah, I have demand for it, but I can shop that around. So the supply exceeds the demand. So the fees will be very low, all right? And so much of the reinvested cash will go back to the borrower. Now, if it's a stock where it's the other way around, where there's uh, a very limited supply and, uh, and a huge amount of demand, and so demand exceeds supply, that's a lender's market. They have the advantage there. So not only... Might there be a situation where they don't give any of the interest back to the borrower? They might say, we're going to keep all the interest and we're going to ask you for a fee on top of that. So it it kind of changes time by you know, transaction by transaction based on the demand for that stock. Now, um, then what the agent lender does is they'll take those cash returns, take their fees off of it and give the rest to the lender. So that's really the difference between the two. Okay, so let me just go back. So if you're talking about non-cash, oops. If you're talking about cash collateral, lender lends a stock, gets a cash collateral, puts it into the money market, gets the returns from that, splits some of it with the borrower based on the uh, demand profile or the net fee, and then takes their fees and gives the remainder to the investor. And remember, the investor will always get the majority of the returns, right? Their assets are the ones that are at risk. And so they get the majority of the returns. So that's how cash collateral works. It's more straightforward in the event of a securities collateral. Hold on. I have, uh, wait. Apologies for this. I'm a little bit trigger happy with this uh, with this mouse. Ah, that's what's happened. I'm not. Uh, I'm not trigger happy. I've mislabeled this. This should actually be non-cash collateral flow. So let me just quickly. We'll do this on the fly. We're just going to make a quick change to the slide. Hold on. We're going to call this on cash collateral flow and get back to the show. There we go. Non cash collateral. Let's pretend the last minute didn't happen. The wonders of live streaming. Right. So again, same thing starts off. The lender will deliver the securities to the borrower. At the same time, uh, the Asian lender knows how much collateral they're expecting. And as I mentioned in a previous episode on the structure of the business, It would be a lot of work if the agent lender and the borrowing intermediary had to move collateral back and forth constantly between each other and maintain different schedules on what each other will accept or what they have. So they often and typically will outsource it to these tri-party providers. That's the JP Morgan that I talked about. That's the Bank of New York I talked about. 
Euroclear, Clearstream, uh, BNP, Six, and you know, State Streets got into the business uh, this year as well. So they'll both appoint this kind of third party, and that's where tri-party comes from, to be the administrator of the collateral. So the agent lender, imagine we're starting off from day one, starting from scratch. So they make their first loan to the borrowing intermediary. They'll then say to this tri-party provider, uh, we expect collateral from that entity to the value of X. And then that borrowing intermediary has to make certain that that collateral is available to them. Okay, so uh, that that's what happens. And then every day that gets reviewed uh, to make certain it's at, at a sufficient level. So every day the lender will revalue it. They'll say to the tri-party provider, this is what today's figure is. And then the tri-party provider works with the borrowing intermediary to make certain there's sufficient securities there. Uh, so that's what happens now. As I said, when the loan is first arranged, they will agree on a fee. So the borrower says, I'll pay you 10 basis points or 50 basis points or 500 basis points, whatever the fee is. The agent lender will then, you know, again, when it comes time on a monthly basis to collect those fees, they'll take their share out of it and they'll give the remainder over to the uh, investor. Okay. So that's the process. The collateral management side of it is outsourced to a third party provider um, and it gets revalued, managed, and uh, substituted on a daily basis. So that's non cash collateral. Okay. Now, uh, just a quick summary again on the collateral considerations when you're actually looking at it. What you need to do is uh, remember, collateral is only required when there's a borrower default, but we have to think about is that just like when Lehman went uh, went into default, it was crazy, right? The market was absolutely crazy. And so what happens is uh, you have to be aware that if a counterparty defaults, normal market conditions kind of go out the window. And so you need to be thinking about the um, three things, the amount, the quality, and the volatility of the collateral. I'm just going to do this at a headline level. Again, we'll we'll dig into it in future, maybe next week, uh, or maybe uh, maybe subsequently. Okay. Um, so the amount. What I mean by that is how much collateral am I going to take? I'm lending you 100. Uh, am I going to be taking 102 of collateral, or 105 percent of collateral, or 110 percent or more? So how much am I going to be taking? And the amount that I might take is going to depend on what collateral I take. So if I take equities because they're more volatile than uh, you know mainstream government bonds, I might want to take a higher percentage of equities than I would if it was government bonds. Corporate bonds are less liquid than equities, so I might want to take an even higher percentage of corporate bonds than I would on equities. Or maybe I feel comfortable with it, all right? And then there's there's other forms. So that's the amount. Then there's the quality. Remember in the chart I showed you from, or the the, the graph I showed showed you from J.P. Morgan, most of the fixed income collateral they held, you know, overwhelmingly was extremely high quality collateral. So credit rating is really important. I've talked about liquidity, and then this final point: the correlation to assets on loan. Imagine I'm lending you uh, Canadian stocks and taking uh, UK government bonds as collateral. Now, I might look at it and say, well, you know, UK government bonds, uh, you know, good quality government bonds, I'm okay with that. But all of a sudden, I have to realize that if you go out of business, I now have to buy back Canadian stocks. And if I sell the UK government bonds, I'll get British pounds. And then I have to convert that into Canadian dollars and then buy the securities. So there's a lot of touch points there for uh, volatility. So ideally, if I could, and I'm lending you uh, Canadian equities, maybe I'll take Canadian government bonds or provincial bonds or other Canadian equities, because at least I'm then isolating out the foreign exchange risk. And it's just about the volatility of the assets, which takes us nicely into the final point which is you want to look at the volatility of the assets. And my point there is, 
if I did this valuation today and I said the collateral I'm holding is worth 100, that's great unless I'm holding a whole bunch of volatile stocks. So if you think of the, the meme stocks this year in the US, they could be up 10, 20, 30% in a day, or they could be down 10, 20, 30% over the course of a day. So that's huge volatility. And I don't really want that because volatility equals risk. Sometimes volatility works in your favor, but sometimes it doesn't. So volatility is an important consideration. Uh, just one other thing. Uh, I just thought I'd let everyone know if you're really keen on learning more about securities lending on an ongoing basis, we operate a membership site uh, where there's monthly tutorials. We have uh, free format Q&A sessions. There's a community forum with threads. Uh, we have uh, weekly um, chats on Clubhouse. Uh, so that's, again, no agenda, not recorded, uh, just a discussion. We're doing virtual ne networking events. We're trialing that right now. Uh, and of course, we produce uh, some content exclusively for members. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can always uh, join up. Uh, but just be aware, the doors are closing at midnight, June 13th uh, for uh, an extended period. I'm not certain exactly how long, but it'll be at least three months before we open it up again. Anyway, uh, just be aware of that. Right, so let's just do a summary and wrap up the show because this will be the longest of the fundamentals that we've done so far. Uh, the purpose and benefit of it is, of course, it provides protection and safety, and it also allows you to trade your uh, to bigger amounts with a wider range of counterparties and in bigger size. So collateral allows you to scale up your business. We talked about the two different models, which is cash collateral, and the reinvestment that's associated with it, and securities collateral, which is the, the, the larger share of it, but all, only captures the intrinsic value of the assets. And really just as a follow-on from that, uh, the fees, the way the fees are collected and uh, determined uh, is different based on the two different models. So if it's the cash, it's the cash split after the reinvestment and the rebate to the borrower. And for securities, it's just a straightforward fee. Don't forget, though, uh, both the fees and the rebates, that actually is negotiable. So again, if you go back to the characteristics episode, which I think might have been uh, episode one, fees are negotiable and renegotiable based on the supply and demand changing. So if the supply is low or is high and the demand is low and then something happens to change that and there's a lot of demand and uh, less supply, then you can renegotiate fees. But it works both ways. So don't forget, uh, that's sort of a dynamic uh, pricing and repricing exercise. So that's collateral. As I said, next week, we're going to do uh, part two. Uh, people asked me at the end of last show why I had this image. And to be honest with you, that's because I think of collateral as kind of my little castle and my protection uh, and my safety net. So that's why I uh, had this diagram. Maybe that makes more sense to you now. I hope so, uh, because uh, that's, that's the intention. Collateral is about safety. So everyone, uh, let me just uh, get myself back onto screen here. And that's me. I hope this was uh, useful for you. Collateral is a really critical part of this business. Uh, we just touched surface level. Next week, we'll go into some more detail, but don't worry. It's, it's not going to be rocket science level. Um, so thanks very much for staying with us. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the series. Uh, if you're enjoying it, give us a like and a subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you next Saturday at one o'clock on YouTube. Thanks.